Welcome, folks, to the November 1st, 2023 Aries Working Group call. We are glad that you're here. The link is in the chat. Uh, if you would like to uh, add yourself to the attendees list or make any other adjustments useful uh, to the community. Um, we have some cool topics today. We'll get to uh, the agenda in a minute. Uh, this is a hyperledger call, so the antitrust policy and the code of conduct are in effect. Links in the agenda. And please raise any concerns if you have them so that we can keep our work uh, excellent and unencumbered with issues. Um, is there anyone new today that would like to introduce themselves? All right, well, I'm glad we're here. Uh, any announcements we should have on our list, but don't. All right, uh, any projects want to share any release status or work updates? Um, Sam Akapai released uh, 011 um, RC1. So uh, we're getting ready to go with that. Um, I don't know that did rotate or did fear four are there. They're not there yet. Um, and then um, the community is working on getting the and on creds RS release next, which will be a breaking change. So whatever comes after 011 um, will be um, uh, will be a breaking change and will include uh, ledger agnostic um, uh, and on cred support. Um, so that's what we're going for. There's very little breaking in 011. There's one um, relatively minor one cons considering the size, it's kind of surprising. Um, but, um, yeah, that's, there was only one, um, breaking item in RC1, in 011, I mean. Cool. Uh, I'm going to pick your brain about, uh, about, uh, implementation progress that did rotate in a minute, Stephen, for whatever's there. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Any other projects want to share? Progress. Okay, we have a cool agenda, a so quick Aries marketing, talking about the logo, uh, Aries Accreta, unqualified dids, and um, a discussion about why moving to Didcom V2 is a good idea. Any other agenda topics or changes that we wanna make before we get going? I had talked about doing a um, discussion on uh, um, the please act protocol, but the controversial question that I thought was there after having reread again on the, under quieter circumstances, the please act, I think it's pretty clear. So there's, it is clear in the, um, in the protocol what's intended. So the question was, I'll just briefly cover this. The, the question was, is the please act intended on the message it's attached to? So the outcome of the message it's attached to or does it mean, oh, uh, I want it on the outcome of the protocol itself? And it's pretty clear um, the intention is it's on the outcome of the message. Uh, so that will make it a little more interesting to implement. Um, but I don't. I think it's pretty clear actually reading a couple, there's a couple of lines in the um, protocol that make it pretty clear. So please act is understood. So that's, the whole topic right there, done. Cool. I act that topic. Okay. All right, let's get going. Alex, do you want to talk about marketing and logos? Sure. Or Helen, you got a preference? Either of us? Oh, go for it, please. Okay. Uh, we have, if you go to the Aries channel on the Hyperledger server on Discord. You'll see a new message this morning or this afternoon, this evening, depending on your time zone, where we've asked you to vote using the advanced thumbs up emoji on 
three possible concepts, which you saw before from that document we had in a couple of weeks ago from the Google Doc of new Aries logos. Again, if you weren't aware of this, um, we need to update the logo anyway to match the new Hyperledger branding. So it was an opportunity to um, do some other concepts for it as well. So you'll, three, so you'll see three there to work on. And we also, for reference, um, have a couple for indie and a non-creds along the same vein. A non-creds a variation of what we've currently got, and indie is a slight departure, but with the same themes, so you can see like a commonality between the um, different logos. So if you go to the Discord, Aries channel in the Hyperledger server, you have your chance to feedback on those. And I think we're at the final stage, having had it in the working in the marketing working group. And with this community input now, we'll just pick one and get that refresh so we can just move forwards. And apart from that, again, this and many other discussions around Aries, there it is, look at that. Well, kind of, this is a screenshot because apparently I'm not logged into to Discord. On <laughs> <laughs> there it is. You can see, you can see Helen and I have got different boats and the logos already there. Um, but please uh, get your thoughts in there. And th this and many more discussions about Aries and its broader positioning and how we communicate it. You're welcome on the last Tuesday of every month at the Marketing Working Group. The link is in the meeting notes. Thank you. Anything else, Helen? Have I covered there everything? Um, I'd also just say that um, on the uh, Aries Wiki page, we have two links to some community resources for folks who are interested to learn more about Aries. Um, to to click on things and and read from from those of you who are working on you know demos and blogs and presentations and recordings and things like that, um, as as all you know Hyperledger Wiki pages are they are open for community edit. So if you have new white papers, reports, recordings, etc., please um, feel free to pop them in under uh, library resources, learning resources um, there. Um, you know, those those are living pages. So please contribute um, as you see fit. If you f see something that's not not listed currently, um, you know, it's it's definitely up to the community to keep that going. Um, and, you know, we will continue to to pop things in as we see them as well. Um, but very, help very helpful if, if you would as well. Um, I would also say if you have a um, business developer type person on the business side of your organization that would be interested in participating in the marketing um, efforts, the kind of brand development efforts of the Aries community, please uh, pass the information along to them for the monthly, the last Tuesday of every month marketing meeting. We would love to have more co contribution, more um, voices at, at that meeting. So if you yourself are not, you know, interested in particular, you know, contributing to that effort, um, but you know, somebody who would be, um, you know, part of your business that would be, please encourage them to, to join. It's, you know, relatively low, <laughs> low effort, um, in terms of, um, you know, kind of the day to day, uh, but we would absolutely love to have other feedback from, um, other parts of the community in that call. So, uh, thank you. Thank you. I've also highlighted here, uh, there's a link to the Discord chat where you can vote on the aforementioned logo th stuff. So uh, that link is also there. Thank you, Alex and Helen. Um, any questions on marketing? All right, uh, Kim, do you want the screen share for Aries Akrita? Uh, sure. Awesome. Um, uh, so previously, um, we put together, uh, there's some load testing inside of the uh, Aries mediator service. Um, and what we've done here is we split that out into a separate project called Aries Accreta. Um, we're adding additional documentation and new functionality. Uh, so in the new functionality category, uh, we now have um, uh, both issuance uh, issuance and revocation and uh, present proof workflows for load testing. Um, we've also um, added better documentation um, and uh, there's some new features that we're going to be adding as well. Uh, so it's a continuance of the work that was inside of the Aries mediator service. 
Uh, but since we're no longer load testing just mediation, we felt like it deserved its own project. Um, we've got design uh, documentation as well. And so uh, we're proposing uh, that this get absorbed into uh, the Hyperledger as a separate Hyperledger project to continue the work of uh, load testing uh, different pieces of uh, the ARIES projects. Um, and I think that's everything I had. And so I just wanted to open it up to discussion if people felt that this is something that the Hyperledger would be interested in uh, uh, having as one of their projects. Yes. Hundred <laughs> uh, percent. So, can you say a little bit more about uh, how it works with Locust and stuff? Yeah. Uh, the basic idea here is um, that in a typical uh, Aries environment, we have uh, multiple holder agents that work with a mediator. Um, they will communicate through an issuer and a verifier, and the messages will be returned to them via a holder. Um, the idea of Aries Accreta is to replace the holder agent with Locust. Um, in this case, uh, Locust will be managing an, an AFJ client um, acting as the holder, uh, but Locust is uh, being the, uh, I guess you could say puppeteer in that sense, controlling uh, the different uh, stages of the functionality of the AFJ agent and their interactions with the other agents. Um, an example of this here is uh, we have a locust worker, uh, locust master controlling multiple locust workers, and it contains multiple AFJ clients. Um, locust itself is uh, written in Python. Um, and so uh, we use a subprocess interface to control um, AFJ. Uh, we picked locust specifically because uh, locust is designed to scale well for um, existing um, interfaces such as uh, web interfaces. Um, and so it has the ability to scale, run large numbers of users, um, uh, support uh, clustering for multiple workers. And so we didn't want to reinvent the wheel on all of that. Um, and then um, the tests are written in Python. Um, there is a... Uh, since we're using a subprocess to control the agent, there is a separate agent.js which runs the um, the AFJ side of things. I know that was a lot of information in a very short period of time. Uh, if anyone has questions, I'll be happy to answer them. So this is a nice addition to the testing stuff that we have uh, with the Aries Agent test harness, but uh, but uh, this is obviously different, not a conformance test necessarily, but load tests and the ability to to drive some uh, performant behavior in um, the system. In the past, we've uh, driven it up to as many as uh, 12,500 um, holder agents at the same time accessing a single mediator. Um, I I have one question. So looking at this diagram, so the holder is locus, so that one scales. Um, is the assumption that issuer and the verifier part, they are static? Uh, the concept here is, um, and the long-term vision of, of the locus environment is to be able to place it uh, inside whatever environment that you have that you want to load test. Um, so if you want to load test your issuer or your verifier or your mediator, um, mm -hmm. right now, uh, the code is set up specifically to interface with Akapai. Uh, the future direction of the project that we want to go is to turn that into a plugin interface so that you could come in and write uh, the custom code to access your issuer or your verifier um, so that you could load test your uh, production or development environments. Uh, okay. So what that means, I think uh, what Kim is saying is that 
if you have, say, an issuer or a verifier that you have, be, you know, already uh, behind a scalable system, either auto scaling or, 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 you know, multiple things, Locus can help you test the performance of that too. It doesn't have to be a single instance. Exactly. Um, so the goal is to uh, support low testing your production type environments or your particular design and workflows. Um, and so uh, right now yeah. we're specifically targeting Akapai, um, but we want to move forward into a plug uh, a pluggable interface to support uh, your custom issuer or verifier commands. So um, if I'm looking at the diagram there, so it's fair to say that you have three systems there under test. So the mediator, holder, a verifier, sorry, mediator, issue and verifier. Yes, yeah, so those are the three test. systems under test. You could split the systems okay. out. Um, so Locust is capable of not using a mediator if you don't want to low test a mediator. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering if those could be combined. If you, if you, if you truly wanted to just test the mediator, can we have three, so only mediator under test and then holder, issuer, ver and verifier, they're, they're three completely um, scal scalable, dynamic, and managed by Locus. So these three systems, the issuer, mediator, and verifier, aren't managed by Locus. Locus will make requests to them to receive an invitation URL and to trigger an issuance or verification. Um, but Locus doesn't actually um, initiate or start up these three services. Locus is only responsible for the holder agent. Um, uh, I know that we had a previous load, uh, load testing architecture that would start up uh, the issuer and the verifier. Um, the intent of this is, uh, environment is to test existing issuers and verifiers um, and in that particular environment. And so the goal of Locust isn't to spin up an issuer and verifier or a mediator, uh, but to test a existing infrastructure. Okay. Thank you. Awesome. Um, one of the, one of the things um, we want to see, and and slightly on your idea of the plugin, um, would be just that Locust would use kind of a back channel to the issuer and a back channel to the verifier to sort of say do something to trigger it to do something, and that would be independent of whether it was AFJ or or Akapai or any other issuer or verifier. It would exactly. just be sort of a trigger. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. We, we, we want to set it up so uh, it's a plug uh, a plugin type interface so that uh, you'd have to meet the particular interface requirements um, and whether that required some custom code on your part or if there's an AFJ plugin that you can simply use or an Akapai plugin you can use. Um, that That's the direction I think we want to head in. I... And I think it's useful to have the clarification that it's testing specifically your setup, not specifically Akapai configured in some way or whatever. That that's the goal of the project. Uh, the, I... a, a th back channel. I'm not familiar with that one, Daniel. Uh, it's it's more or less what Stephen was just describing is just the back channels interface that triggers actions in. Uh, a set of supported agents that a uh, the Aries agent test harness already interacts with. So it might be interesting to look and see if we can reuse those same back channel interfaces to accomplish that. Oh, that is I, I think it's I think it's even simpler than that. I mean, we could use that, but it's it's even simpler than that. Um, but the, but it is that same idea that the back channel is, you know, the front channel, if you will, is the didcom interface. The back channel is something that triggers um, the agent to do something. We might even be able to, you're, you're right, we might be able to use um, AATH as a artificial tool, but I, I agree that the real goal is to to test out real issuers, um, the controller and the, you know, Aries framework involved in an issuer in a verifier and really the mediator as well. 
and 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 Plessio, just so you know that what locust is a bunch of infrastructure but but it also is a uh, has as part of it a script that says here's what i'm actually doing in this test i'm contacting an issuer and getting issued a credential and i'm contacting a verifier those scripts are completely um uh adjustable so you can have them you know everything else stays the same but you adjust what actually goes on in the script the tasks that get executed in the script so that's the set of tasks in this particular one go ahead yeah I'm familiar with Locust. So I, I, again, by looking at the diagram, there are three different systems under test. I'm just wondering. So in that scenario, so if I'm looking at the diagram, I can only test two of them that has to be, if I'm solely a verifier, if I want to test the scalability of my verifier functionality only, does that mean I have to provide a issuer or, or can the issuer be keep be mocked because I just okay. want to see the throughput of the, my verifier. So we can uh, test just the verifier so, under load. We would still need an issuer to provide the holder agents with a um, the credentials with the credential. Right. Uh, so an example here is. Um, this workflow has the accept and receive credential as different tasks. And so those will be repeated. Um, I believe there is a workflow that has um, uh, this workflow here. Um, these are not tasks. Uh, and so they get create, these just run on start. So we accept a single invitation and uh, receive a single credential. And then the only task that we repeat is the pr uh, presentation exchange task. And so, so that, in this case, that's... you would still need the issuer oh. to issue the initial credential, um, but we would only be low testing the verification portion. Okay, so, so the question is, is there a value on, on having two two of those systems to be uh managed or scalable under 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 locus because that that means you're implying that you need to have a sure service that potentially needs to be scalable or not i i don't know because if you're creating i don't know twelve thousand wallets i mean you need twelve thousand credentials you can't just be like a simple agent that doesn't have some level of of performance optimized right Otherwise, um, you're going to be testing the verifier, and and the your issuance process will be slow. Uh, the issuance process can be slow. Uh, part of Locust allows you to uh, bring up the number of users at a slower rate, and so you can say we're only going to start one user every five seconds or something like that. And so, if you have a, a non-performant issuer, uh, you can still. Uh, reach your desired number of users, but you might have to go at a slower rate to get there. You could have the users get one credential and then present it over and over and over and over and over. Yes. But, uh, but that way you'd only need to scale the issuance according to how fast you ramped up the workers. And you exactly. can still pre pressure test your verifiers with a and, large number of workers and verifications. And the scaling uh, for issuers and verifiers happens outside of Locus. Yes, the um, the, it's a sub process outside of Locus. So each time you scale up the verifier issuer, it will launch a separate sub process. Um, if your uh, individual machine can't host the number of users, then you would want to scale up the number of Locust workers on separate machines to support um, a larger number of verifiers. So. Sorry, I think I'm confused because I don't think you're scaling the issues very far. You're only scaling the holders. Isn't it, that what yes. I understood? Yes. Okay. Uh, we we don't manage the scale of issuer or verifier or mediator. Um, that's the responsibility of the person who's managing their infrastructure. Um, just like uh, in a locust environment, you're not managing the scale of the HTTP web server. You're only managing the scale of the number of HTTP clients in the Locust environment.
And while you could go ahead and have the issuer and verifier be the same machine through your testing, that would obviously, when you're issuing credentials, if you're just doing verification only tests, you still have to issue those credentials on first load. And that would obviously put more load and stress in that one set of machines if you have them doing both tasks. Um, but that's why it's useful to do load scaling, because in some environments, you might have the issue and verifier be the same agent. All right. Um, I think that answered my initial question of, should we integrate this into Hyperledger? So I'll go ahead and make the, the ticket and request that to be transferred to Hyperledger. Uh, and we will move forward uh, with more of the work on Ari Secreta. Um, and I will also provide status updates in the Hyperledger call on the progress that we make with Aries Accreta. Cool, Kim, I've also added in the chat the link to the Aries back channels into the uh, the notes for the, the, the meeting notes. Thank you. Um, that would be I, cool I if have it's a... able to be reused. Hello, uh, I have a question. Please, uh, Please uh, yeah. I just I just want to understand uh, about Acrida. Uh, uh, we can test if we if we if we uh, want to test only the mediator. Is that possible? Just the mediator. Well, to test just the mediator, you need some agent that will send messages through uh, the environment. And currently, um, we use the issuer or verifier to send the messages through the mediator. Um, okay. Uh, that test could be yeah. redesigned, but that's the current structure that we've used to test passing messages through the mediator. Uh, there is another workflow where we only have a single agent that connects to the mediator, an AFJ agent, um, and sends ping requests or messages through the mediator. Yes. That, doesn't, that doesn't properly test it acting as a mediator um, because there's some extra wrapper information that happens with um when you pass a message from another agent through the mediator um and, and that complicates the the locust environment significantly which is why we use an external agent right now to pass the message through uh, either an issuer or a verifier um okay uh thank you because I, I was just thinking about the testing my mediator about just this uh, the mediation and the connections is, is, is that uh, that's what I was asking uh, this question. I think that the actual load test can do that. The uh, the load test that, that is in the mediator service can 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 do this kind of test. Am I wrong? Um, doing issuances and verifications can put load on the mediator. Um, we also wrote a test that specifically uses the mediator, uh, the, the issuer to only pass uh, basic messages through yes. um, the mediator. Um, and that's called the locust issue message test. Um, and that can be used either with or without a mediator. Um, and what that will do is uh, have a message be passed through. And what that does is that tests basically the uh, the encryption layers um, with a predetermined message size. Thank you. Nice. Uh, thank you, Kim, for bringing that up and, and for the work there. The um, this is useful to test. Sometimes, uh, you know, it's common for someone who wants to run an ecosystem to under, want to understand the, the the capabilities of the ecosystem as a whole, and so this is a, a good realistic test of that, um, which is which is useful in, in lots of ways. So for component work, it's really nice to test individual components. For sort of you know sort of integration testing of the entire ecosystem, this is this is a really valuable uh, way to do that. Uh, okay. Uh, unqualified dids uh, revisit. We've made a bunch of progress here, and I want to highlight that uh, quickly. Um, uh, Stephen, um, on did rotation, you had mentioned that you were uh, working on um, uh, that, that that was on the list for implementation in Akapai. Any feedback uh, about uh, about did rotation, not only from Stephen but but anyone who has spent some time in implementation? Uh, any thoughts or comments? 
That would be a Daniel Bloom question. He did some work on it and has a work in progress um, on it. So always it's da Daniel. Daniel, you caught a redirect. Um, it's been a minute. Uh, I, I did a bunch of work just to, to test out the spec, so to speak, um, see if there is anything that um, wouldn't be too easy to implement in the, in the context of ActPy. So I, I did a bunch of initial work and I haven't revisited it in a while, but I think the feedback that I had has already been fed back into the, the spec. So uh, nothing really new there on that front. Cool. So I'm, I'm guessing that you're not opposed or you don't have any, uh, don't anticipate any additional feedback on it. Mm, yeah, no. Okay. Has anyone else been working on did rotation and implementation? Okay, so this is still exists as a PR uh, in in uh, in the Aries RC repo, um, not uh, not yet merged. Um, a bunch of this other stuff has been merged, and so. The, the goal there is to try and figure out when there's been sufficient amount of time, uh, but, but, you know, but enough that folks, you know, recognize that that's stable and, and worth developing towards. And so without any comments, we'll likely merge that in the, in the near term. Um, the um, moving on to did peer four, uh, this has been merged into the, uh, into the spec uh, itself um, as well, uh, by the way, is, is the did peer two uh, corrections that uh, were also uh, previously under discussion. Um, and so it did peer four is is here and and merged as as part of that work. Um, there will be an effort to deprecate zero th zero through three, um, but that's hasn't happened yet. But that can begin now that we have that merged. But but that's a little bit of a separate topic. So did peer four um, is is moving along there. Link here to the browser resolver demo that uh, that Daniel produced um, to to help with you know understanding of that. Um, any any comments anyone wants to make about did peer four? Questions, comments, anything? All right. So uh, did exchange um, with uh, this handles the case where you are uh, doing a did exchange and you're rotating without an attached did document. Uh, this PR is open, um, is is not yet merged. Um, the, the most recent thing that we discussed was that this did need a version bump to 1.1. .1. This is a minor release given that it's the addition of an optional thing. Um, and so, and so that was added. Um, and so, uh, any comments on, on, uh, on did rotation or, or, or uh, did based rotation on, on did exchange. So there was a, a, a link to the PR that I opened up to act by in that PR since I linked to it from that. But it, anyways, um, I'm in the process of implementing this. Uh, I've done a very early implementation of it so far. Um, spec wise, I didn't come across anything that was ambiguous or, or problematic or anything like that. Um, I'm still in the process of testing out the actual implementation itself. So there might be some feedback that comes as I progress through that process. But um, an early implementation has been done, at least with an ACPI and a draft PR. Nice. Okay, this one is also similar. Uh, without any comment or uh, or corrections needed, this will this will get merged relatively soon. Um, that brings us to the community coordinated update, um, which is the combination of all of these things into into completely moving off of unqualified dids. Um, it has been noted that the previous community coordinated update we've we've had fully completed ones in the past, um, but the uh, but the most recent one, which was to move off of uh, of of uh, the connections protocol into dead exchange, um, is uh, has been really slow in happening, um, and and that's that's an interesting point for discussion. Um, part partially that's uh, you know moving uh, unqualified dids does not in, entirely uh, encompass that, but a move to did v two would um, because they're the or or kind of avoids the issue in the sense that it, it wouldn't really happen uh, or or isn't isn't used in in did v two at all. Um, and so one of the things that I have about the community coordinated update coordinated update is when we think this is reasonably accomplishable to adopt all of these things uh, as a community like what what target date might be possible here 
we're at the at the first of November, making month math easy. Um, any thoughts on what we should uh, identify as a community for the adoption date uh, for these uh, for these related technologies in the full deprecation of unqualified bids? Can we do this by the end of December? Speaking from the ActPy perspective, which is where I've been implementing a lot of this stuff anyways, um, I, I think by the end of December is a reasonable target for ActPy. I would agree. Yeah. Um, I was thinking more about um, pushing it through um, what's got to happen in AFJ. Um, AFJ would need, I believe, two updates um, plus an addition. So um, a tweak, what I think is just a tweak to did peer two. Um, would need obviously the did rotation because it's not there and would need um, the addition of did peer four. The did once you have did peer two, getting to did peer four, I think is a lot easier. Um, we also have a TypeScript library but, that wrote for did peer four specifically. So, okay. So, yeah, that would help. Some stuff already exists there. But AFJ is, AFJ would be the one. Um, Aries VCX, I don't know if um, um, Patrick's here today, but um, let's push, let's ask them about that as well. Now, part of the uh, community coordinated update, Sam, does that include um, uh, actually deployment? Because um, there's the implementation side and then there's the deployment portion. It, it includes deployment, but yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and there's two phases of the deployment. One is is the ability to understand all the new stuff, and the second phase is the ability to by default use the new stuff and don't use the old stuff anymore. And so there's I I, I really have dates here, um, and so uh, by this these are implementation dates that we're talking about. So you bring up a good point. Um, does bifold automatically inherit? Uh, any work that happens in AFJ or is there additional work that would need to be done in Bifold? There, it does uh, inherit and there's additional work, I think. Sorry, Clesio, go ahead. It, yes, we'll, we'll inherit that. Uh, we're, we're probably going to do some tests uh, still just to make sure, but uh, we inherit all the work from AFJ because that's all underneath. Under Maybe some UI changes, but but possibly not very much. Yeah, I will I will say that for for Bifold, it's just a matter of configuring the initialization of the of the agent. For instance, to include the bit rotation and that stuff, but minor changes, I will say. Uh, so with implementation. We also then need deployment targets. Um, so if we have a build ready uh, by the end of December, uh, then we need some additional time for deployments uh, so that folks can deploy updates to the code that they have based on this. Um, I don't think the timeline for that should be shorter than a month uh, and, and possibly longer. Any, any thoughts on, on, uh, on the timeline for deployment? Maybe six weeks. And we can discuss this again. Um, it's worth talking within your teams and, and projects and stuff about what this can be. Um, the goal of the community coordinate update is twofold. One is to obviously motivate uh, these sort of necessary changes and in, in, uh, in, in as soon as we can reasonably do. Um, but it, it also has to be a reasonable date that we can hit, 
right? Um, we're all volunteers here in this group working together. Um, and so trying to figure out, uh, you know, what's, what's important and, and what matches um, with development timelines and deployment schedules is important. Um, so does that four to six weeks, would that be heading into the end of December then? Well, I think the four to six weeks happens after the implementation is ready. So that's where we're looking like January, February for a deployment okay. deadline. Okay. Because I certainly wouldn't want deployment to kind of hit year end. No, 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 no. Yeah. I was just thinking about holiday stuff as well, where uh, <laughs> even though everyone's back in January, everyone may not be back mentally from vacations and whatnot. Uh, yeah, so that we're talking like end of January into February is kind of the, the end of, of deployment for that. Like deploying at the end of the year during holiday season is like the extreme form of not deploying on a Friday, right? Um, and uh, this deployment is specifically around the um, understanding of the new stuff, not necessarily uh, speaking it themselves, right? Well, that's that's the first one, yeah. Um, and then uh, ideally, the 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 subsequent um, and and this is written in the community coordinated update. Uh, and then the, there's the um, uh, I didn't do this right. And then there's the um, there's the second phase of that. Oh, great. I used magical text there. Um, the default to new deployment can actually roll once the, the understand new deployment has occurred. The default to new can begin immediately uh, after completion of this of this milestone, um, and we want to. Uh, we want to set a, an end, you know, a reasonable end date to that, um, but it doesn't prevent anyone from then making the secondary step there. Um, and, and then, and then, as soon as we kind of set the community uh, thing here, then, then that, uh, um, yeah, thanks. Um, uh, then this, uh, then this can happen immediately, and then we set a deadline by which, you know, afterwards it's deprecated and and no one is expected to understand the old. Um, and so uh, that's the important bit here. But that has in the in the early part of the year, this is uh, we we have entirely then wiped out unqualified dids. Um, any existing implementations are able to rotate away from them, um, and uh, to but but still keep action uh, active connections active. If you are in a situation where you don't have active connections uh, deployed in production, and it's possible to just wipe them out and use the new ones, then this is easier. Um, because there's there's a lot less work to do um, in you know in the default to new deployment where you begin rotations and everything else you just you just start using the new ones and you're done you don't have to actually perform any rotations unless that's actually necessary for continuity cool any other thoughts on the schedule or the or the topic of unqualified dids at all. I'm going to uh, put those dates into the community coordinated update. I had not done that yet, but I think we're close enough that we can kind of see what's what's coming at us, and we might be able to to do that. Um, and so, uh, and then we'll be able to use that as as, uh, as a coordinating topic um, within the community. Um, awesome. Okay, we have nine minutes left. Um, this is I, I thought I might have longer for this, but what I'd love to do is is spend. Uh, nine minutes with a quick argument about why a move to did combi two is valuable, um, and then we can have a further conversation uh, as well, either in chat or um, or in our next meeting to kind of revisit some of these topics. Um, but that way we've uh, we've had some sort of initial discussion on the issue, um, and and we can uh, and and we can continue the conversation as we've had time to think about it. Is that okay with everyone, or would you rather push till till next week? Okay, I'll, I'll give it a I'll give it a good go in a, in a couple of minutes here. 
Um, so uh, Aries, so brief history, Aries One was born here in the Aries community, and that's what we're uh, using and targeting and, and demonstrating in production interop with, which has been awesome. Uh, Didcom V2 was created in a dev working group um, under the interest of having it not be an Aries only specific, you know, an Aries specific thing. And, uh, and so that spec has been created. Um, there uh, overall, I believe the most, uh, most of the changes are in simplifying things that occurred. An example uh, is attachments. There used to be three ways to do attachments. There's now one, um, and, uh, and that's an example of the simplification. There's also no need for, uh, because of the, the design of the thing, there's no need for, the, um, uh, for a handshake protocol such as did exchange or the connections protocol. Um, any message that you receive contains the did of the other party, which then allows you to, re to send a response message back. Um, which means that uh, that the very first message you send can be semantically rich. This uh, is not dissimilar from the um, from the process of um, of um, of the um, connectionless mode in Didcom v1. Uh, if you were if you're trying to, to work on um, uh, if you're trying to make that happen the, the advantage there is that um, is that because it's sort of the default it allows you to have the connection last as long as useful so you can um, accomplish useful work on the first initial message and not require a, a round trip of handshaking um, but also uh, allows you um, to retain it for any length of time as necessary including forever if, if that's the kind of connection that you're looking for um, and so um, the and, and there's no anticipation of going back to uh, having a handshake and now that we've worked out how to do it there's no um there's no uh, intention to of going back to that which means that an adoption of didcom v2 um gets us into that handshakeless interaction mode uh, which i think is really valuable um the it also aligns with with uh, demos tools and presentations uh, the the didcom book for example um is is written purely for didcom v2 um, and there, there is mention of Didcom v1, but the documentation does not live here. Um, the demo uh, that, uh, that Daniel um, has created, Daniel and Colton and Micah have created, for example, are, is, is purely Didcom v2. Um, and so the, the new things that we're working on are all uh, you know, aligned with that, which means that adopting Didcom v2 inside of various projects brings us in alignment with that documentation um, and with the, the tools uh, and presentations that are, that are given on that. Um, it also eliminates criticism of protocol choice and demonstrates, um, even though it's, uh, it's simply V2 of something we're already doing V1 of, the fact that it was not created inside of Hyperledger Aries um, shows the, the uh, utility or the, the, the uh, projected plan of adopting um, uh, protocols created elsewhere into Aries projects. That, uh, of course, includes the OpenID for VC uh, protocols and others. Um, but uh, but this, uh, this means that we're no longer using something that was born here. Um, as the primary mode of, of, uh, of communication. It also cleans up historical issues with Aries. A lot of these things overlap in Venn diagram circles, but um, it, clean, it uh, cleans up the historical Aries uh, uh, issues uh, with Aries in the sense that there, were, there was very little implementation of Didcom v1 outside of the Aries community, and there, there is uh, you know, uh, use of, of Didcom v2 um, there as well. And so um, and it also aligns with extended Didcom adoption. Uh, Veramo is an example of this. They have a, a Didcom uh, module um, that, is, that speaks Didcom v2. Um, and so being ready to interop and, and show other folks um, that, uh, that Aries is, is fully on board with this, I think is good. Um, uh, criticism against the move is that it doesn't, uh, on the surface, it doesn't add very much. Um, there's not some brand new feature we don't really have in Didcom uh, v1 that is added in, in didcom v2 um, in the sense that it gives us some brand new ability uh, that we that we want and don't have in any other way um, this will continually to this will continue to occur though as new development is focused on on didcom v2 um, and that not being there prevents us from rapidly taking uh, advantage of the innovations and the other things that are improving um, in in the didcom world um, because uh, little effort is spent um, trying to improve or solve problems within, within Didcom v1, which means all existing or all new credential exchange work, for example, will focus entirely on uh, the formats required with attachments in, in Didcom v2, et cetera. Um, and so the, uh, the, the new work will all be there. Uh, so it's not that they, it's the, not that we're trying to gain some shiny new feature, is that we're trying to align with where the work is going um, to make that happen. 
Um, it is some work uh, to make that happen. In particular, uh, you know, when we first, uh, when when Aries projects were new, um, you know, making sure that we could do the connections protocol and uh, you know, in the very early days, and, and make that happen was a big focus. And so, uh, some of those design elements or the the need for a handshake protocol are present within some of the software architectures, and we'll need some adaptation and some refactoring to uh, to accommodate this model. Um, but uh, but that's the valuable piece of of moving to this. Um, finally, and this isn't my notes, but um, uh, occasionally someone will ask me, well, if the trust over IP is working on the trust banning protocol and that kind of looks like DIDCOM, like why should we do DIDCOM v2 instead of moving to that? Um, the answer there um, is that by the own admission of the trust banning protocol work, that's going to be at least another 18 months before that's really ready for production use. There's some, uh, they're, they're trying some, some early test implementations. Um, but there's there's no uh, solidity to the spec there, which means it's not going to stop moving for for quite some time as they as they work out details and and try to make that stuff happen. So while that could be good work, um, it's not really going to be ready for production. And in, in, in Didcom v2 is um, it's here and, and ready to be used. Um, and so uh, and so that's a little bit of a quick outline. Um, any comments, questions, things I didn't address, etc. Uh, with our remaining two minutes, and again, we can pick this up on a, on a future topic if necessary to make this the, to uh, to to properly address this. I do want to go ahead and mention that uh, with the simplification that you mentioned, it also drives uh, well. Simplification drives more adoption because the simpler something is, the easier it is to adopt. Indeed. Now, to set expectations, it's not like DIDCOM v2 is like nine times simpler than DIDCOM v1, right? It it uh, it still addresses all the same issues in the in the same goals. It but it uh, it um, it is it has been, I believe, simplified, um, and so there are fewer sort of special case handling of things, etc. Any other comments or questions? All right, we have to, we're out of time today. Um, grateful for everyone coming, uh, grateful for the discussion uh, and, and moving forward with our community work and also Aries Akrita, uh, great meeting today. I uh, appreciate everyone coming. Uh, if you would like topics on the meeting or you'd like to bring something up or, or, or lead a topic or even just ask a question that you don't have an answer to, those are always welcome. Uh, please reach out to, to me and we'll get you on the schedule. Um, and, uh, and, and that's fantastic. Uh, I, if you've ever run a community, uh, you know how grateful I will be to, uh, to have folks that want to bring up and lead discussions on things. So the floor is always open um, and, uh, and grateful for you coming. Um, and we will see you all uh, next week. Thanks for all your efforts, Sam. It's much appreciated. You're welcome. Hopefully it's helpful. Absolutely. Thanks all. All right, thanks guys. Thank you. Thank you.